<laughs> yeah, ever since I was a little kid, I always wanted this camera. I read America's Cinematographer magazine and Aton used to have a full page spread of this camera with its glowing LCD display and it was just so different than the German cameras in the SR. And I was using an SR in later life and um, even in later life I always wanted one of these things and I never ever ever thought that I could afford one. And when film went downhill in 2012, 2014, in that range, these cameras were being sold for a dime a dozen. And it was really sad. And I invested and bought an LTR, which I upgraded to the XTR Prod here. And today we're gonna to talk about my all-time favorite film camera, the Aton XTR Prod. <laughs> Why I designed a camera? Because I needed a camera for me, for my film. The gentleman who invented this camera, Jean-Pierre, is a genius. And he spent almost his entire life developing a quiet camera. I wanted to make a film to explain what is the beauty of an old town compared to the new town. I had the idea to have one image and the space was described by the, the I call that the son concomitant, that is the, the simultaneous sound at the, this very moment. Not sync, not lip sync, but simultaneous at the very same time. To have many tracks uh, for the sound, simultaneously recorded with the image in the camera, I had to invent the time code, and I invented the, the way to, to make it uh, crystal, the first crystal camera, in fact. The viewfinder here and the camera there, so you are, you are with the person you, you, you shoot. That was the Aton uh, principle. And the shape was because of my uh, cat on the shoulder. I founded Aton in 1971. Super 16 was uh, the, the Aton uh, claim to fame because we had a very with steadiness and, and very crisp images. And, uh, and, then, and then after, uh, video uh, wiped out almost everything. Um, there's a lot of things about this camera that make it more documentary aspect rather than narrative feature. And I have shot a feature with this um, and it came out great because all you're doing is moving film through a movement. So you're not, you know, the camera body's not big of a problem outside of the usability of the camera on set. And of course the camera works great on set. Um, their philosophy was to make 10 cameras at a time and then they would um, make small changes as they went along. And so this camera is kind of middle of the road. Uh, the camera that came after this, the um, Xterra, is pretty much the same camera. Um, there's not very many differences, actually. Um, video tap's a little different, but I have the Xterra, pretty much the Xterra viewfinder. Um, the electronics are the same. Uh, even the lens mount's the same. It's really just the tap and the battery system. Um, so let's, let's take a little walk around the camera. So on this side, we have the on-off switch. This is test and this is run. I don't like push button start stops because it's easy to tap them and get the camera shut off. I love the switch. It's very affirmative action. Um, this is the main display on the camera. This displays basically what frame rate you're running at. It also displays how much film is left in the magazine. You set this manually and then it counts down as the camera runs. It also saves it memory so when you change magazines it remembers which magazine has how much film left and so on and so forth. From left to right, this button is the set speed, this button is the sync speed, this button is the variable speed, this is the ISO and battery, and this is the mag and elapsed time. So when we put a new mag on, we're going to hit set, set mag, and we're going to increase this to our 400 uh, feet, and then hit set. And then we want to change the ISO, we hit set, ISO. And there is our 500. We can, use the, we can use this button here to change it, or we can use the knob down here to change it. Either way, doesn't matter. And then um, 
to change our sync sound speed again set time and then we can change the sync sound speed that way the camera will run up to 75 um, frames a second there it is 75 set to adjust the aton glow this knob raises and lowers the aton glow when you're not in the menu system this switch down here turns the built-in light meter on or off and this is our tri-phase motor which is different than the older cameras which have a bi-phase motor the camera sync sounds at many speeds including 25 and 24 which is very handy it has a very very bright viewfinder this is the main viewfinder um, and the viewfinder can go on both sides for left-hand operation, though I recommend not doing that because the video tap's kind of in the way, but it's a possibility, which is nice. Um, the standard XTR prod has the diopter over here, and the Xterra has the diopter here. That's one of the major differences. It's nice to have the diopter on the eyepiece itself um, for people who you know want to make adjustments very, very quickly. It's nice to have it right there. Um, on this side as well is the magazine release, and the magazine release in this camera is a pull method. You just pop the mag off. Um, on the opposite side of the camera, we have the video tap. Aton makes a bunch of different video taps. This is the last generation called Video Assist, or VSA. Um, it is a very, very decent tap. This is the camera for the tap. These are the electronics for the tap. These electronics are what generates the on-screen display, and these are the buttons that control the on-screen display. Up here, you can't see it, but there's an adjustment here for the iris on the video camera because, of course, the camera can't adjust for the ISO of the film. So you have to make manual adjustments to the iris based on the ISO of the film you have. And then um, we have a port up here in the front. This port is for the Aton hand grip. And then we have a six pin and an eight pin in the back here that are used for accessories. I happen to be running an NP1 battery system, which is a very modern battery system. This little knob right here, you turn to then take the battery off. So we have a NP1 battery, but then this cup comes off. And then you'll see in here that it has a standard four pin, 12 volt battery connection. And then we put our little cup back in. And this is the way the normal Aton batteries sit. They'll sit like this and you'll screw this knob in to lock them in place. Again, we use the NP1 solution and that just slides in like that and it makes it all very compact and neat. I use these um, super, super nice um, very zoom batteries that are lithium ion that have D-taps on the top of them so that it's very easy to run accessories off the D-taps. A lot of modern accessories do D-taps versus any other power source. The camera also has power right here. Um, there's, a, there's a plug right here for power as well, which is what I run my um, wireless video off of. So that's kind of the rundown on the camera. Oh, one more thing before I let you go. The main fuse for the camera is right here. That's the main fuse. And this is the gate. Um, and we'll talk about the gate and show some videos of it up close in a little bit as well. This carbon fiber handle has a couple of neat features. One of them is this little adapter that pulls up here that allows you to hook the tape measure on too, so when you're measuring focus, you have a reference point. And then of course, everybody knows about the tools that are built into the Aton cameras. The black tool, which unscrews, is for the ground glass. And the blue tool is for changing the shutter angle. In front of the camera is our PL mount. We take this cap off, and this is our shutter. To change the shutter angle, you want to pull the battery out and then slide the shutter over until this little gear you see here lines up with a little hole down here. And then the blue tool is what we use to access all this. So we're going to slide that over and line it up. And then we're going to take the blue tool and push it into the hole, like so. And you'll see the shutter expand and that's 144, and you'll see it contrast. So it does 180, 172, and 144. And then when you're done with it, to select, you want to do one full rotation of the shutter to make sure it's in position, or put the battery back in again, 
And when you put the battery back in, go test, and it should be okay. To check the gate, you'll notice when we go test, it'll open up and we can see the film. So that's how you check the gate. The only reason why they have this small shutter adjustment is so that they can compensate for TVs in different regions and flicker in lights. The XTR Prod and the Xterra are the only two 16 cameras that they made that have variable shutter, and they're the only two that they made that have removable ground glass as well. Um, the XTR Prod is a Super 16 camera. Um, it can be very easily converted to standard 16 by simply changing the mount slightly. Um, there are screw holes in the mount, um, and there are labels in the mount that mark Super 16 or not. And all you do is basically unscrew the screws around the outside of the mount, pull the mount off, twist it, and screw it into different screw holes. And that recenters the lens to make standard 16. There's also a standard 16 ground glass available. Um, the camera does have a um, built-in beam splitter for the video tap. To control the beam splitter, there's a port on the side here that you then take um, a tool, a different tool, and plug it in there, and you can actually um, turn on and off that beam splitter. Um, if you, for some reason, don't need the video tap and you want all the light to go to the viewfinder, you can change that beam splitter. On this side, this port over here actually controls the ground glass location. This is a big no-no adjustment because when you do this, you change, you change the theoretical flange distance of the viewfinder. And in doing so, you could really screw up the viewfinder and, and again, your focus would be off on your film. So don't ever change what's in here at all. Don't ever open that port up. That's a big no-no. Um, the camera does have some neat features. One of them is this really nice rail system in the front of it. Um, these are pretty standard threaded rails. In fact, if you if you notice, you can actually thread them onto the bottom as well. So the the pitch of this and the thread type of it is pretty standard. The rail system is really simple, um, and they just screw onto the front of the camera like so. Um, and the biggest problem with this camera is that the stock rail system, this bracket in the front breaks off on. There's a, there's a, there's a, the front of the camera has it built on to the actual housing and it's easy to break off. So this is an aftermarket part that was manufactured and you can drill holes in and, and screw it on and then you can, it won't ever break off again, basically. You're going to, you're going to break a rod before you're going to break this off the front of the camera now. So that's a neat little upgrade feature that the camera, this particular camera has. There are a lot of accessories made for the Aton cameras. The main one everybody loves, of course, is the wooden handle grip. This is a killer tool. A lot of digital guys use these. They make them um, for, for digital cameras that are not Aton specific. Um, it has a switch on it, and one direction is run and one direction is test. Um, test opens the shutter halfway so you can check the gate. Uh, it's also what you need to load the film, and we'll talk about loading film in a minute. So that's one of the major accessories. Um, this camera also has a, um, a 15 millimeter rail kit to attach the grip to the rails, which is super nice. We also have this box over here that has extension viewfinders. This is the Aton Zoom extension viewfinder. This allows you to zoom in um, 3x so that you can zoom in on an image and you can focus it. Uh, when you're doing um, a lot of work where you can't measure to see how close your focus is, um, you can use this zoom tool to actually zoom in, focus, and zoom back out again without having to zoom the lens in and focus. So if you have like a prime on the lens, uh, so if you have a prime lens on the camera, um, you can use this to zoom in, um, which is really really nice. It's a it's a it's a great it's a great uh, it's a great extension viewfinder. The other extension viewfinder is this big guy. This is the long extension viewfinder. Um, and this is basically so you can run the camera from, from behind the camera. So you can run the camera back here. Um, I love this extension viewfinder. I use it all the time with my sticks. There's a lot of confusion about how the viewfinder works in these cameras to, to change the viewfinder to an extension viewfinder. The first thing you do is loosen this whole assembly up, twist the viewfinder the opposite direction, and then you're going to twist this counterclockwise, this silver ring, and it's going to take the eyepiece off. And then you're going to put on the extension viewfinder. See this little pin right here? There's a little pin on the extension viewfinder. And you're going to stick the extension viewfinder in those pins. And then you're going to lock it in place. 
and that's how you stick an extension viewfinder on the Aton. The XTR Prod um, shoots with 400 foot film on a core and it also shoots with 100 foot daylight spools as well. Um, unlike the Airy cameras that have removable core in the center, the XTR Prod does not have removable core for the take up. So the take up's always going to be on a core. The supply could be on a uh, 100 foot spool or a core, it depends on what you want to shoot with. The other thing is daylight spools, of course, make noise, whereas in the cores don't make much noise at all. The camera's pretty quiet with a core in it. Loading film into the XGR Prod magazine is one of the easiest tasks you can do with any motion picture camera, in my opinion. Uh, it's a lot easier than the SRs. It's a lot easier than so many other magazines. They've really gotten it down to a science with this camera. Um, of course, the film has to be loaded in the dark. Um, we use a very inexpensive changing bag um, it's just a photography changing bag. There's nothing really special about this. They're on Amazon for like $35. Um, and inside the changing bag, you're going to open the can. You're going to take the film out of the black bag. You're going to pull the tape off the film, and then you're going to glide the film directly onto the core on the supply side with the sprockets facing down. And then you're going to push the film through the loop like so, and you're gonna close the door. All you need is a little tiny bit of film through. You don't need very much. You're gonna lock the door and you're gonna flip it over to the other side. This side you can do in the light. Now, I don't recommend doing it in the light because I feel that doing it in the light um, uh, you know, breeds dirt and dust onto your film. It's better to just do it all in the changing bag. So I have learned how to do it in the dark by doing it a lot and it's not a big deal. But what you're going to do is you're going to pull out film from here and you're going to put it through this hole over here like this and you're going to put it back through the other hole and then you're going to put it directly onto the core. So it basically is going directly onto the core. The core does spin counterclockwise on this camera. So just be aware of that. And then once you've got it on the core and you've got a couple spins on it in the core, I usually do like three or four spins. Then what you're going to do is you're going to open up the doors for the sprockets and you're going to basically load the camera into the sprockets. So you load the top one first, then you take two fingers and push it between the uh, plate here and the film and then you load the second one second. So open the trap door up, put the film between the trap door and then close the trap door. Now if you did this right, you wouldn't spill your film all over the place. And then that's going to give you the 14 1 4 perforations that you need to create a perfect loop. Uh, when we're done, you'll see there's a little bit of looseness on the film here. Um, when you're done, you'll see there's a little bit of looseness on this film. So to take up that looseness, we hold on to the sprockets and we pull like this. And that'll take up all that looseness. And there it is. So we're going to pull the film out of the mag and we're going to count how many uh, perforations we see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. You want 14. You don't want 15. You don't want 13. You want 14. 1, 4 perforations when you pull up on it like this. Then you can push it back down again. And that's it. And now your magazine's ready to go in the camera. You can, you can pull a loop out or you can close it. It doesn't matter. What I normally do is I usually push this in and then we're going to go ahead and put it on the camera like so. And then the first thing I usually do is load it. So I'm going to go test once and listen for a click. That was the click. And then we're going to go test twice. And if you don't hear a click on the second time, then it should be good to go. So we'll run it. And then we're good to go. And then I'll go ahead and hit set, mag, and set my number around 395-ish because that will alert me early to the film running out, which is really nice to have. And so we know the camera now works, and that's the critical part, because if the camera's not quiet like that, it's not gonna work. I think a lot of people don't realize that the XTR Prod's very sensitive to set up on magazine. So why don't I give you an example of the camera not working so you can hear what it sounds like when it does not work properly, because it's really, really easy to get it not to work properly. So we're going to do the same exact thing again. And now we're going to listen for that same exact sound again. 
Here we go. We're going to go to test once. Test twice. I still hear that noise. Let's try it a third time. I still hear it. So if we run the cam right now, it's probably not going to work. Not good. So when we hear that, we know that the loop is probably the wrong size. In this case, I just made the loop 12 perforations. That ain't going to work. So we definitely need to make sure that we get our 14 perforations. One, two, 14 perforations total. And make sure the trap doors are locked. There they are. 14 perforations. Let's try that one more time with 14 perforations. Listen for it again. One, two, ooh, three, it's not working. So in this case, when we definitely have 14, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, <clears throat> 13, 14. We have 14 perforations, but it still didn't work. We're gonna push the film down and we're gonna run it with our little wheel here. It only goes one direction. We're gonna run it a little bit and then we're gonna stick it in. Now, let's see what we got. One click, no click, good to go. So that's, those are some of the tricks you can use to make sure that you got your camera loaded properly. Um, and, and really that's the only main thing. One tip that I'm gonna tell you guys right now is this little guy right here, this the film counter, needs to be in the locked position when you load the mag, so that's important. Um, you need to push this button here to hold the core in place. So you push the button, it opens up these guides, and then when you're done, you squeeze them, and that is how you get it off. Um, I always, 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 without fail, tape these latches. These latches are one of the weakest points on the magazine. They're super, super fragile. They're a piece of metal um, that locks on a basically tapped onto a piece of plastic. So they're super fragile, very difficult to get a hold of. You want to tape the edges of these to make sure that when you brush by, it doesn't unlock them. It's not like the SR, which is a positive lock. There's no positive lock on these. This thing just slides open on its own. Tape it. Make sure you tape it. Make sure you tape this edge around the outside here as well, because this rubber seal is the most difficult, tricky seal to deal with. The other seal is never going to fail, and it's a it's in a light trap. It's a little bit of better design. This outside seal is really not a very good design, and a lot of times the rubber chips, and then it falls apart, and then you're really in trouble. I tell people who use this camera to make sure the gate is clean um, between each roll of film. Make sure that you take a cotton swab and you swipe down the edges of the gate, both sides, and make sure the gate is clean. Um, you can use your fingernail and a Kim wipe as well, and just wipe down the edges of the rail with your fingernail and a Kim wipe. Super easy to do. Make sure the rails are clean. Make sure the spring-loaded rail guide is also working. Um, that's gonna be on, when you're facing the back of the camera, that's gonna be on the right side of the gate. You can see a little spring. That spring is super critical, and you wanna make sure that whole area is clean as well because if it's not clean, if that spring is not pushing against the film, then what'll happen is the film will start to go back and forward in the gate. Doesn't mean that the film's not gonna be good, it just means that when that back and forward happens, what you're gonna get is instability in your image. To keep the camera really stable, you gotta make sure that you use that and clean it as good as you can. Every single magazine you put in, make sure you clean it. If you don't see any dirt and it looks pretty clean and you blow it off with an air gun, then you can keep on using it, but I would clean it as much as possible. The other thing to clean is the back plate, the pressure plate and the magazine. Uh, behind the film is a metal plate. Same exact thing. Kim wipe, a little bit of some rubbing alcohol, anything really just to clean off any brush of dirt because that's pushing against the back of your film. If there's any dirt in it, you could scratch it and you don't want that to happen. So when you're done with your film and your film is all wound up on this side, it's all going to be wound up on this side. And when you're done, it's all wound up. Then what you need to do is just open this one side up and pull the film out and put it back in the bag again. I save that piece of tape inside the can that comes on the film and I tape the film in the mag. I put the tape on in the mag, I put it in the bag, 
put the bag in the can, and I put the magazine, an empty magazine on top of the can, bang, so that I know that that can has been done. Because a lot of times you might be doing two or three mags at a time. So you want to put the mag on. And the other thing to do is if you are using that tape we talked about in other videos, that with the labels and that says the scene number and take and reel number, um, you definitely want to take that piece of tape uh, and put it on the can before the can leaves the bag to make sure there's no confusion of what rolls what. Now, finally, and this is super important, and for people who want to buy an Aton, any Aton camera, you have to be aware of one critical thing about power. These cameras were sourced originally with power regulators that don't take much more than 12 volts. They actually overheat and fail with much more than 12 volts. So you can get away with it. You can get away with 16 volts for quite a bit of time, but eventually you're not going to be able to. And eventually the camera will stop working. And it happens to every single Aton made. It's an it's a inherent design flaw in the particular chips that they use. I have a fix for it here. Um, if you have a camera that isn't working properly, a lot of times the display will start giving some weird codes. The camera won't power on. Um, there's a lot of weird things that it does. But as soon as you start seeing those symptoms, um, let me know. And I have a kit here that I can either sell it to you for cheap money. You can do the soldering work yourself or I can do the soldering work for you for cheap money as well. Um, it's, it's important to replace those if you're using regular batteries that are mostly 14 and a half volts nowadays or higher. Um, 12 volt batteries are almost impossible to find. And if you built your own 12 volt kit, you'd have to power regulate it down to 12 volts. The camera can take more than 12 volts, no problem at all. It's just those power regulators that it comes with are very, very old. Sometimes you see cameras that already have the power regulators fixed on them, but mine didn't and, and most people's don't. So be very weary about that situation and power and voltage. I don't like the stock Aton battery solution. I think it's garbage, so that's why I don't use them. I'd rather have the MP1s. They're much more powerful. They have everything you need and the D-taps are, are a game changer for people who want to use modern follow focuses. Um, so that's basically the whole kit. But yeah, I mean, that's pretty much my video on the camera. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we're gonna have another video coming up really soon about the 35.3, and we're also gonna talk a little bit about the little brother to this camera, the LTR. See you next time.